Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Friday, May 9th, 2014. I'm on my way to Utah today for that event I've been telling you guys about. But I will not leave you orphans. We have a program today for you, and it's a great one. You know, it's just wonderful to me that I get a chance to speak to so many authors writing so many interesting books, and that so many of these interesting books are written in our tradition. The libertarian tradition, the Austrian tradition, there's so much of this going on that I can't possibly feature everybody. What a difference 30, 40 years make. It was a lonely, lonely time all those years ago. We have much to be thankful for. But by the way, before I forget, as long as I'm mentioning events, don't forget I'm going to be speaking in Boston on June 2nd and in St. Paul, Minnesota on June 19th. You can get the details about those events at TomWoods.com on the events page, TomWoods.com slash events. Well, today I'm glad to welcome to the program... Economist Christopher Coyne, C-O-Y-N-E. Chris Coyne is the Associate Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, and F.A. Harper Professor of Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He's also a Professor of Economics and Director of Graduate Studies in the Economics Department at George Mason University. He was a Hayek Visiting Fellow at the London School of Economics. He is the Co-Editor-in-Chief of the Review of Austrian Economics, the co-editor of the Independent Review, and the book review editor of Public Choice. He joins us today to talk about his new book, Doing Bad by Doing Good, Why Humanitarian Action Fails. Chris, welcome to the program. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here. That's quite a good and effective title you have, Doing Bad by Doing Good, because there are a lot of people who are well-intentioned, who think they're doing good, and have done an awful lot of bad over the years. Let's start off talking about uh, maybe just foreign aid in general. I want to talk in particular about your thesis in this book, but I want people to have a sense of what the record has been, let's say, since World War II in state-led development efforts. We have the ledger now, and what is it telling us? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, you raise a very important point, which is since World War II, the governments, nation-states, have become the, the central or, or dominant player in um, international affairs and, and, and humanitarian action and foreign aid. Uh, and this is very important for understanding the effectiveness of aid. Uh, now, the record um, is mixed, depending on how you measure it, but, but the clear consensus, if the goal is promoting long-term sustainable development, by that I mean development uh, and reductions in poverty that do not require continued external assistance, then, then foreign aid has failed. Um, now, some people point out... Um, typically advocates of aid, they'll point out individual cases of success, whether it is things like building infrastructure or schooling or, or hospitals. Um, but when you look at the long-term trend um, related to um, growth and development and improving standards of living, uh, foreign aid has been a failure. Now, we need to understand why it's been a failure, because it would seem, at least from superficial glance, that sending money to impoverished countries ought to do some good. And I think it comes as a surprise to people that it generally either hasn't done good or, in some cases, has even retarded progress. Now, why should that be? Right, so you're exactly right. On the at first blush, the, the, the problem seems quite simple. So there's, there's people that are poor, and the idea is, uh, look, these, these individuals are, are basically living at subsistence level, so they consume everything they produce, uh, and they can't save. And in order to promote economic development, you need capital investments. You need to forego consumption and, and invest in more roundabout processes of production. And the argument goes that they're stuck in a poverty trap where they can't do that. The idea behind foreign aid, or one of the key ideas, the key ideas is that uh, wealthy countries can, can break that cycle by filling the investment gap and by giving money to these people that they then can invest. But, of course, the problem isn't that simple because humans are involved. And so decisions need to be made about who's going to get aid, how it's going to be allocated, and then the recipients, of course, have to make decisions about how it's going to be allocated as well. Uh, and there's really two kind of core reasons, if, if I had to summarize it, why aid fails. The first is, is the famous uh, Mises uh, high point on economic calculation, which is outside the, the market process, there's no way for central planners 
to know how to allocate resources to their highest valued use, which of course is a necessary um, prerequisite for development. You need to continually reallocate resources to new and better uh, uses from the perspective of consumers. Um, in other words, producing things that people value, not just producing random outputs as determined by a planner. Uh, and this, this logic doesn't just apply to um, central planning in, in the context of socialism, which of course is, is where Mises and Hayek were focused, but also to central, uh, excuse me, to foreign aid, which is uh, kind of a, the new form of central planning, if you will, uh, which is that uh, supposedly enlightened experts uh, who are typically very well educated in at top top ranked schools, uh, you know, get together and, and decide how much aid a country is going to get, and then uh, allocate that aid and tell them how to spend it and attach conditions to it, and so on. And so, really, you have the, the planner's problem in the context of foreign aid. The second issue, then, is politics, uh, which is, so you have a fundamental problem of how you're get, you, you don't know how to best allocate the aid, but then you dump millions and millions of millions of dollars in, into um, already corrupt and dysfunctional political uh, institutions, and the outcomes are extremely predictable, which is you not don't just um, get the money wasted or stolen, but you also perpetuate those dysfunctional institutions. And the costs tend to fall on ordinary citizens who are already suffering. So the issue here then is not a matter of having good good people in charge of the programs, that maybe we have had people who haven't been as effective as they might be, and if we can only get more competent people in charge of the system, things will work. The problem uh, is the assumptions behind the whole approach. Uh, you start off the book talking about the man of the humanitarian system, who th- thinks that really these problems that we observe around the world are problems that can be solved if people of goodwill just put their heads together, organize resources, uh, go over there and get things done. But it's not a matter of good intentions. It's not a matter of organizing properly. It's, there's a problem at the heart of the whole system. That's exactly right. So the, the man of the system idea comes from um, Adam Smith and the theory of moral sentiments, and, and he characterized this kind of uh, mentality or this idealized type of, of bureaucrat who comes up with a, a plan that they view as a beautiful plan for society, and they think that they can move around people as if they're pawns on a chessboard. Uh, and, and that's really the kind of mentality that um, of, uh, is, is prevalent throughout um, international relations in general, uh, which is that supposedly enlightened experts can, can solve all these problems if, if they just have enough resources and enough smart people. But of course, this not this ignores the fundamental knowledge problems and the fundamental um, incentives that that these both the planners face, but also on the recipient side as well. And it just happens over and over again. If you read pretty much any government report on foreign aid at the end, there's always a, a lessons learned section, and it's typically always the same thing. We need better coordination, more resources, better planning. Uh, but that completely ignores the fundamental problem which you just mentioned. Now, in order to evaluate humanitarian programs and efforts, I think it's helpful to ask this question. How in general, if we were to generalize across experiences of many countries, how in general have poor countries become wealthy? Sure. So, um, uh, of course, the history of each society it varies greatly, but, but at the core of, of economic development is, is private property rights and innovation and the subsequent developments that, that follow from that process. And, of course, it's a, it's a never-ending process. Uh, we know this. All economists know this. Uh, it's just an issue of where the emphasis is placed. Um, so a lot of economists uh, make the argument uh, that you need to kind of centrally plan uh, markets and then in, in order to then get the subsequent development generated by markets. But, of course, there's a fundamental irony there, which is markets are desirable precisely because uh, they don't need anyone to plan them. They're, they're self-ordering, um, and self-correcting, and, and they, they generate uh, desirable outcomes on their own. Um, and, and markets can't be planned, just like the outcomes of markets can't be planned. Uh, so that's ultimately what's required for, for development is, is freedom, economic freedom, and the protection of private property rights. I think today when people think about humanitarian intervention, though, they don't think about the types of state-led development programs, the, the very ambitious programs of the 60s and 70s, I think they're thinking precisely about finite projects like the ones you mentioned at the beginning, that, well, can't we get clean water over in this area for X billion dollars, and can't we vaccinate this many children, or can't we build schools over here? And if you're saying that, well, by and large, those do seem to work, 
then how does that not undercut the case against humanitarian intervention? Sure. So this is a, this is a great point. And, and I, one of the things in the book, and I should say, for a moment and talk about what I tried to do. So when, when I first started writing this, I was focused just on short-term immediate relief, things like you're pointing out, vaccines, um, food, water, shelter, and so on. But very quickly, I realized that it's very hard, if not impossible, to find a state-led effort that is narrowly focused on just those things. In reality, what happens is it's a combination um, of, of uh, short-term aid, but also long-term development. And the idea was this. Uh, in the 1990s, the humanitarian community got together and said, look, uh, we can't just keep giving short-term aid because that might help them today and tomorrow, but what about the next day? And what about next week? Uh, are we going to stay here forever and just keep giving them handouts? And they said, well, we can't do that. So we have to create the conditions for development so that we can leave eventually. So very quickly, short-term development efforts transformed into a hybrid of short-term devel- uh, humanitarian aid plus long-term development. Now, in the post-9-11 world, a whole new element got added, which was the, uh, the militarization of humanitarian aid. So now the U.S. military got involved, and it's a combination of short-term relief, long-term development relief, and um, squashing supposed insurgents. And so you saw this in Afghanistan with the whole idea of a government in a box, which was the military is going to go into an area, kill the insurgents, the humanitarians are going to follow the, the military and provide short-term relief, and then the development experts are to come in and provide long-term relief and build democracy and, and supposed good stuff that we were going to bring um, to Iraq, Afghanistan. And we know how that turns out. Same, same issue in Haiti right now. Um, it's, it was supposed to be immediate short-term relief, and the promise then was long-term development. Uh, that's kind of the, the motto was we're going to build it back better. That perfectly captures the man-of-the-system type mentality that we can build Haiti the way we want to, we being the experts. So you can't really separate um, those things. On top of it, even if you look at short-term aid, so even if you do isolate that uh, in, in the kind of things like health care, vaccines, and so on, the, the record's very mixed. And so you do see cases where the U.S. government and other governments have successfully provided aid. But, you know, if you step back for a moment, this isn't that shocking. If I said to you, look, I want you to buy more water, and I handed you money to go buy more water, and you bought more water, I wouldn't count that as a success. That's logic, the logical outcome of spending more money on something. The more shocking outcome is that more often than not, the U.S. government tries to deliver short-term aid, and it never arrives to the people in need. It's either stolen, it is sold on black markets, uh, or the money is just wasted. If we spend it on things that, by we, I mean the U.S. government, spends it on things that people don't need. And so even in those cases, it's unclear that uh, short-term aid is successful. Now, in terms of the long-term development and long-term development aid programs, the key figure, of course, is Peter Bauer, who was a voice crying in the wilderness for many years. And then in the 1980s, he began to be vindicated as more and more people were taking a second look at these state-led development programs and saying they've had disappointing results, to put it mildly. Uh, even the New York Times by the 1990s was saying, well, everybody knows these programs don't work. Well, it's funny for them to say that now because I'm sure they thought they worked, uh, they were a good idea in the 70s when everybody was laughing at Peter Bauer. But then, as the 1990s wore on and we got into the 21st century, then we started to hear something called the new economics of foreign aid. That yes, 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 we know that if you send money to a bad person and bad regime, you're going to have bad results. So we're going to try to target the money to good regimes. Well, what's funny about this economics of this new economics of foreign aid is that they've been trying that for years. I mean, even Jimmy Carter who prided himself on his commitment to human rights, spent half of his foreign aid budget on black Africa in what was then Zaire. Uh, giving it to Mobutu, one of the worst people in the world ever. So, the number one, they've been trying to target it, supposedly, for many years, so I don't trust them to start with. But secondly, let's give you the most difficult possible case. Let's imagine they do, they are able to isolate individual political leaders who really, who are like Chris Coyne, but they're in charge of a government somewhere, and they just want to promote the free market. What if we send them foreign aid? What if we help kickstart investment in their countries? What would go wrong there? Sure. So, so here, here's the interesting irony behind all that. The people that are, or, or the governments that have the capacity to handle aid the way we want to, in other words, to use it the way the U.S. government wants, don't need it, actually. Uh, and, and the reason why is that they're already committed to limited government and 
of, of, of um, you know, limiting corruption and not taking stuff from people, then investment will follow. I mean, the problem in countries that don't have, can't attract foreign investment is, is simple, which is that people don't want to invest their property in countries where there is predation and confiscation by government. So it's actually relatively simple in terms of the, the solution, which is governments need to stop taking stuff. And it's a simple test. Just stop it or don't. It, it's no foreign aid. Foreign aid is not going to help the problem because if you're already committed to this, you can adopt policies conducive to that. If you are not, and you say, well, I need foreign aid in order to adopt these policies, then you should have no confidence that they're going to actually adopt them because they're all, they already have proven they can't uh, overcome the dysfunctions in their own political setting. So the money's more likely not going to be wasted. So again, foreign aid is most likely to work where it's lead, needed least because the state capacity already exists. It's where it's needed most because the people are suffering the most. It's going to work uh, the worst because state institutions are, are so dysfunctional, which is what the cause of human suffering is. And of course, it's going to encourage these uh, state institutions to persist in the very policies that have driven their countries into the ground, because why should I reform if I keep getting money, the, the poorer the country is? Now, you made brief mention earlier to Afghanistan, and I think a lot of people do know a little bit about what happened there, but I bet the average person really just knows a few headlines. What was the problem in Afghanistan from your point of view in terms of humanitarian intervention? Was this a humanitarian intervention to start with anyway? Well, you know, in the book, the way I tried, in doing bad, the way I tried to define it was is very broad because, I, again, I realized very quickly that lots of people mean different things by humanitarianism. And, and so uh, I defined it as efforts undertaken by the state with the stated end of improving human well-being. So the, the end is stated by government officials. From that standpoint, um, Haiti falls under, uh, excuse me, uh, Afghanistan falls under the definition because the idea was we're going to not only root out insurgents that are a threat to the U.S., but also um, nation-build and bring liberty and, and freedom and democracy to Afghan citizens. Uh, and, and the problem with uh, the effort was, of course, that uh, the, well, there's numerous problems, but the, the main one was that you, the U.S. government, just like all governments and, and all social scientists, actually don't know how to nation build, don't know how to build a free society from the ground up. On top of that, there was a blatant disregard for history. Uh, General Stanley McChrystal, who of course oversaw the Afghan forces for several years, uh, in, you know, in 2011 he was speaking at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he, and he admitted, he says, uh, you know, this is a direct quote, we didn't know enough and we still don't. Uh, most of us, and he says me included, had a very superficial understanding of the last 50 years. And so, you know, these people didn't even bother to read a basic history book uh, about what had happened in Afghanistan over the last century. Uh, and, of course, if you go back to, to the attempt by the uh, Russians uh, to invade, we know what happened there. Uh, and, you, you know, there was a lot of lessons to learn there as well. And so really what's happened now is uh, the U.S. government is stuck in a, in a, in a terrible spot because uh, about 95 to 97 percent of the country's economy uh, is dependent on foreign aid. Uh, the, the main um, kind of crop is, is, is poppy, um, and of course, the U.S. is pursuing kind of counter um, counter attacks there. One is they have, of course, the war on terror, um, and the other, of course, is the war on drugs. So, if they and of course, the U.S. flip flop on this policy during the Afghanistan occupation, they started destroying the poppy crops as part of the war on drugs. But then they realized that Afghan citizens were going to kind of revolt against them because that was their main staple of their main livelihood, and so they shifted policy multiple times. Um, there's no semblance of a of a of a any kind of national government, but of course in Afghanistan the history of the country is such that there's never really been a strong national government. So the idea that the U.S. could supposedly just put one in place in a matter of a couple years was was pure nonsense. Now, of course, when we're talking about things like improving water quality or spreading education, that's one thing. But I could imagine some people saying people suffer from things other than lack of access to education, clean water, and things like that. Sometimes they suffer from a government that is outright murderous. Sometimes there are atrocities taking place around the world. Can you extend your analysis to include interventions to help people in situations like that? 
Yes, and, and I, I think that's a very important aspect. So uh, early on in the book, I talk about something called the Responsibility to Protect Norm, which was this norm adopted by the United Nations uh, in the early 2000s. And the idea is that, look, um, we, you know, the typical kind of international relations story, and, and of course governments oftentimes don't follow it, is that there's sovereignty. There's national sovereignty, and you don't intervene in a, in a sovereign state unless they are threatening or attacking your state. That's the simplified baseline version. The responsibility to protect norms said governments have a responsibility to protect their citizens if they fail to do so, if they commit genocide or crimes, if they are perpetuating famine or things along those lines. The international community, meaning other governments, have a moral responsibility to intervene and to um, correct the situation. President Obama kind of invoked the spirit of this norm when he justified the U.S. intervention in Libya. And uh, it does my analysis fits actually quite nicely because Libya is a perfect example of something that to many people seems like a obvious clear-cut case for intervention, but it's a disaster. And so people said, look, there's not going to be any U.S. boots on the ground. This is a short-term commitment. What can go wrong? Basic logic of the seen and the unseen, which, of course, we emphasize in basic core microeconomics, uh, which is you just don't focus on the observable, but also the whole chain of consequences that emerges. In the context of Libya, the scene was you had Gaddafi, who was uh, a terrible person violating human rights. Of course, we forget that the U.S. government uh, was his, his friend on and off for, for decades, uh, but we'll put that aside for a moment. Uh, and so the U.S. government helped overthrow him. So what, what's the unseen? Well, domestically, it's chaos there now. It's the equivalent of a civil war. There's militias throughout the countries that are imposing significant costs on, on other citizens. Uh, there's no national government that has any kind of strength or ability to create order. On top of it, the chaos spilled over regionally, and right after we overthrew the U.S. government, overthrew Libya, uh, Gaddafi, uh, the French had to intervene in Mali. And the reason why is because uh, Gaddafi's security forces fled to, to, to Mali and attacked the government there. Of course, on top of that, arms are flowing out of, uh, out of Libya into Syria, helping create chaos there and fueling that chaos. So the, the broader point is here is that things that appear to be obvious cases where we should intervene, meaning the U.S. government and other governments, are not that clear-cut at all. And when you take into account the complexities of the world and, and the idea that the alternative isn't, you know, Gaddafi or a limited government that, that is constrained in any kind of way, uh, the, the kind of cost-benefit analysis becomes very murky very quickly. And then, of course, although this is not central to your thesis, the reality of a situation is that Americans are faced with a media that is going to feed them what the political class feeds to it. And so we're likely to get an extremely distorted view of what's happening in, well, Libya, Syria, and a variety of other places, which further constrains our ability to make a sensible decision. That's exactly right. It's, it's some sense even worse than that because – these things are like passing ads, so it's, it's almost foreign interventions have become like the flavor of the week. Yeah. So it's, it's not only the misinformation, it's, you know, Libya is a hot topic today, Syria tomorrow, now the Ukraine, tomorrow there'll be something else. And, and even if you were, let's say, a, you know, an ordinary U.S. citizen who goes to work every day and, and reads the newspaper, and, and even if you wanted to delve into, get the details, it would be quite hard to do just because you'd be overwhelmed constantly by the new threat and the new supposed crisis that, that is happening somewhere else in the world. And so it's, it's overwhelming from that standpoint, and it's very easy for you know, those, in the, like you said, the political class, but also the private sector that benefits greatly from these interventions, um, what's known as the military-industrial complex. They have an incentive to constantly create kind of new threats and crises, um, and, and voters, uh, you know, the average citizen just can't, can't keep track of it. Now, at the beginning of your book, you inform the reader that this is not a how-to book. This is not going to tell you how to improve people's lives. But you have to anticipate that that is the natural question someone will ask. So if you had to give advice based on what you know, having written this book and the case studies that you've looked at, what would it be? Sure. Well, when I say it's not a how-to book, I, have, I do have an argument for what, what the, what, what's a better course for helping people. But the standard kind of practice with books on foreign aid and international relations is you point out all the problems and you come up with a nice clean list of you know, the U.S. should do these five things. Right. They're very, usually very simplified steps that, that, again, the promise is if you just follow these this time, it will actually be different and will we'll fix the world. 
Um, but but here's here's what what I call for at the end of the book. Instead of the outward orientation of there's us, meaning the the U.S. or the first world and them, which is kind of everyone else that we need to fix, uh, I, I want to focus on a shift to an inward orientation. And by that I mean what we in the U.S. or other first world countries do to help the poorest people in the world, those who are suffering, those who the supposed humanitarians claim they want to help. And my argument is there's lots we can do. And 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 there's a few simple policies that, that we could adopt the U.S. if we truly cared about the poorest people in the world. First of all, trade barriers. In the, in the poorest countries in the world, uh, they're typically agricultural-based economies. And, of course, if you look at the U.S., if you look at the European Union, what they do is pass massive barriers to agricultural products as well as a whole host of other trade barriers. Again, we know why they do this, because special interest groups in the agricultural industry benefit from them costs are, are imposed upon those people who are suffering. So if we truly care about those people, removing those barriers is something that U.S. Citizen, citizens should agitate for, as well as anyone concerned with humanitarianism. Second uh, is migration, barriers to migration. Uh, allowing people to move around is, is one of the best ways to help them. And I, uh, I have this example at the end of this book because, of course, someone might make the counter-argument, well, these things might benefit people long term, but what about short term crises? And uh, we have a great natural experiment, which is after the earthquake in Haiti hit in 2010, there was um, 200,000 Haitian citizens who were in the U.S. They were here legally; they had the appropriate paperwork, uh, but that that those papers expired. And so instead of sending them back uh, to Haiti, given the destruction, the government granted them temporary extensions. Those. Haitian citizens, those 200,000 Haitian citizens, it's estimated by the World Bank, sent $360 million in remittances back to Haiti, back to, back to family and friends in Haiti. That is more foreign aid in the year 2000, in, in, excuse me, that is more than the amount of foreign aid the U.S. government gave in 2010. That's a year. And so imagine what could happen if you double that number to 400,000 or 500,000 or, or so on. And, and you can see why this could have a major uh, beneficial outcome for people who are suffering because people who send remittances back money to their country of origin have a stronger incentive to make sure it's being used to actually help people as compared to some bureaucrat who's sitting in Washington, D.C. or some field office spending other people's money and, and checking off a bunch of boxes of, of output measures for success. Well, the book is Doing Bad by Doing Good, Why Humanitarian Action Fails by Christopher J. Coyne. His website is ccoyne.com. That's C-C-O-Y-N-E.com. Chris, I appreciate your time today. It's a very interesting book and an important one. Thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Remember, on Monday, we're going to be talking specifically about how to navigate through this new and bewildering economy. You can't just do what your father did. You can't just go to college and major in anything, and then automatically checks start being sent to you. It's a different world today. How do you navigate it? That's the subject on Monday when we'll be joined by Charles Hugh Smith, who will talk to us about his very important new book, Get a Job, Build a Real Career, and Defy a Bewildering Economy. Make sure you subscribe to the program by using the easy iTunes or Stitcher links at TomWoodsRadio.com because you get programs like this coming at you Monday through Friday, and you don't want to miss any of them. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Don't forget 50% off at LibertyClassroom.com where you can learn the history and economics they didn't teach you in courses you can listen to in your car taught by me and by people I trust. Use coupon code DISCOUNT in all caps for 50% off for listeners of this program. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. The Tom Woods Show.